Here we are, uh, yet, yet again, and, uh, and I think many things have changed and, and a few didn't. Uh, I do think that, if anything, privacy is now uh, more, uh, more important than ever, really. Uh, and we are going to discuss a little bit about why, and we would love uh, all of you guys' input. So this can be quite collaborative uh, in this sense. So, um, Zuko, uh, we just received uh, some funding from the Zcash Foundation to do a, a Shielded Transaction mm -hmm. podcast in the next year, where we have a few people on. Uh, that really just try to communicate to the public why we should care about privacy and where we may end up if we don't, but also the types of new innovations that can be unlocked uh, if we do have really good privacy-preserving uh, tools at our disposal. So can you maybe just give us a little bit of um, a foreshadowing of like why we should care, why do, should we care about private crypto transactions in general, then why now, and what's happening geopolitically that makes this a really pressing issue right now? Okay, why we should care in general, you guys already have your own opinions about that, right? Mm -hmm. Privacy and uh, voluntary choice is something that probably most people here already care about. And in specific, I think that the whole Bitcoin revolution, I love that talk that Joshua just gave. I don't know where he went, but that was amazing. That was a really great talk. Um, and we got up to the part about blockchain and Bitcoin and the founding values of Bitcoin were independence from central bank, manipulation of the money supply and privacy. Uh, but technologically, it was a complete miss on the second one, right? Like that was their best attempt and it wasn't nearly good enough for privacy. Um, and since Bitcoin's development, uh, the necessary scientific innovation, which is zero knowledge proofs, has made privacy possible for blockchains. Um, Satoshi and Hal Finney and others actually talked about whether it would be possible to fix the privacy problem in Bitcoin. It was maybe 2009, 2010 when they were talking about that. And in 2009, 2010, zero knowledge proofs weren't practical, weren't good enough to do it. So they literally like, tried it on and said, oh, if only we could get these zero knowledge proofs to work, it would be something that was much better, but we can't. So they gave up. And, and Zcash is the thing that I helped found. And that came out about six years later, because in those intervening six years, there was another advance in cryptographic science, which made it possible to have zero knowledge proofs built into blockchains. Um, and you also asked, what is the sort of geopolitical or the big picture. Um, yeah, why is now a good time like to care why, about Why is stuff? now the right time is to care? Is it now more urgent than five years ago? Is it less urgent? Yes, I think that um, the internet is, pr or the world as a whole, but specifically the internet part of it that's integrated into the world of a whole is a progressively hostile environment, right? We've seen this since the internet first came out in like 19... 70s, 1980s, that at first everyone you would meet on the internet was trustworthy because <laughs> it was the system administrator from the other university or the other research lab, right? Um, and it's progressively hostile. And also in the larger world, my perception, this is just, this is just my intuition about things. I'd be happy to hear anyone else's, but my perception is that the uh, large centralized power structures are increasing, they feel increasing license to exercise their power and to encroach in a broader and broader way on other people. And there's this really important tie-in, privacy is necessary for sovereignty, right? Like if you wanna, if you're like the Nazis and you wanna ban books or whatever, you don't need to do it by preventing the printing or preventing the shipment of books. Uh, you do that as well. But what's really very effective is just let it be known. If we find out you've been reading that book, you're going to regret it, right? So just if you have that kind of a power imbalance, which we have in spades, then privacy is the only thing that allows the small players to have their own individual choice and be like fully human. Does that answer that question? Yes, that <laughs> That's why I think it matters, question. and more now than ever. Well, I think oftentimes what you hear is that, you know, um, I think there's a legitimate concern on the sides of some people that, like, look, if we have private transactions, lots of bad stuff can happen. Mm -hmm. But I think that the flip side of showing, actually, that, like, look, uh, we may not care about it now, 
but if we don't care about it now, we will really regret later not having cared about it earlier. That argument is harder to make because you only find out how important it was kind of after it's too late. Yeah. And so what do you think about that asymmetry? Is there anything yeah, we could do about it? Uh, you're getting at like the passage of time. This is something that really bothers me is that like the unencrypted internet that we started with 15 years ago. Um, much of it may have been lost, but much of it may be stored by people who may be intending to use it for bad ends in the future, right? Like your, anything you did or said in the past can eventually be used against you. And the same with the unencrypted blockchains like Bitcoin and Ethereum. Um, th those are absolutely like, what's the word? Hoarded up to be used against people for forever by any future actor. And I want to respond to something you said about, I think it's really telling in our society, maybe more outside of this room than inside this room, but in our society, my experience going around like promoting Zcash in different contexts, it is probably the biggest, most common, most impactful objection to this kind of strong, like mathematically uh, assured privacy is that it can be used for antisocial ends, right? Like crime or something that's harmful to society but beneficial to the users. And I think it's really telling that that's where people's heads go. We, it seems to me that we live in a sort of paternalistic age where the, the assumption is that some centralized power structure is the pro-social force and that the individual choices of a whole bunch of people is, needs to be kept in check by the centralized pro-social force. And I think it's really easy to get people to start thinking differently when you say, okay, but instead of thinking about like the FBI or, or your local nation or whoever you think is the centralized pro-social force as being the actor, uh, what about the centralized power structure of your enemy country? They also have access to your internet and to your copies of your databases and to, or, or what, what do you think about the uh, uh, organized crime as the people that you want to have privacy from? Or what do you think about your government that you love so much they want to use blockchain or databases or communications. What do you think about their enemies having access to, to their actions? So you just pick different examples and then this will hopefully make people think of the, the general pattern here and not of this first example that pops into their minds every time. Yeah, I think, I mean, uh, two things to that. Like on the one hand, I think it is really hard to see. There are lots of, I think, uh, technologies ramping up that could create an existential risk like, uh, on the long run. And I think the only good tool that we sometimes think we have uh, are the more legacy um, uh, institutions, right? But I think we mm. uh, in the community that is pushing towards decentralization also need to make a strong case that no, look, we can have safety from those risks, but we can have it in a decentralized way uh, and we can have it in a way that is still uh, private. And I think like one thing that uh, when we had our last seminar on this, actually in our intelligent cooperation group, that one point that you had made is um, uh, coming back to the point that you made about um, uh, about um, uh, currently um, pu public blockchains already it, it being a little bit too late for them. It's just like if we actually build a, a system of commerce that is on uh, more and more on those rails, then uh, everyone who's already transacted on this, um, over time machine learning will get better, traffic analysis will get better, and over time all of the people that have already transacted may, uh, uh, may eventually be able to be traced back. And so I think that you know the sooner we can move to, uh, for some transaction at least, to the private sphere, I think the better. But do you think it, in some sense it's already too late? Like, because uh, especially people early on that moved on there, um, they may now be, become physically extortable. Or do you think that there's anything you know, still to be done there? I don't feel like it's already too late. For one thing, if you move to a private technology, then that de-links your past actions from your future actions right there. So that seems like an improvement. Not too late. OK, yes. Yeah. Um, I think in some ways uh, it, it's too late for us uh, because our identities and our affiliation with the technology uh, is well enough known that people can form inferences about what our holdings are, what are what you know, even when they're private, uh, and the organized crime is, I think, the, the right thing to focus on in, in, in the argument because it's comparing like with like. It's the existence of the the unshielded public records itself facilitates crime. Uh, so. The, and so now you can compare like with like. Uh, and even if 
the, the existing public records make things too late for many of us, we're not building this for us. We're building this for, you know, for the future, for, for people who are going to grow up with the systems that we're building and have the option to be private from the beginning, to separate mm. their corporeal self that's, set, that's vulnerable to violence by, by many actors, to separate that from their cyber self and to do that separation from the beginning so it's not too late for them. And younger people are much more open to using crypto from the get-go, in my experience. <laughs> yes. Um, so I think we talked a little bit about, you know, why individual folks should care, right? Um, but I think that, like, one thing that we haven't really touched on is just, like, there's also a whole bunch of new um, actual applications that we could build uh, if we have really good zero knowledge proofs. Do you want to, like, paint us a picture of this? Like, what could this new world look like? And, and instead of just wanting to do things private anyways, but, like, what are new applications that could be unlocked? I'm not very good at vision. I'm, I'm better at empirical ex post facto. So I can tell you, zero knowledge proofs are this amazing, uh, we saw a picture of, of Diffie and Hellman. It was about 10 years after that picture um, when zero knowledge proofs uh, were discovered in the 1980s. And it wasn't, again, it wasn't until 2016 when Zcash came out that zero knowledge proofs were used for anything in real life. So it took like more, about 30 years um, between discovery of the science and, and, and application and deployment. And so far, so the first use of zero knowledge proofs, as far as I know, for, any, for, for anything real that was used in large numbers for large value is Zcash for private payments. And hold on, I've got to interrupt myself. Anybody who installs Zec Wallet <laughs> on their phone, I will give you like a thousandth of a Zcash, Zec well, Wallet. It's spelled Z E C. Z E C. Wallet. And, and it only takes like a couple of minutes, and it's fun. That's that's my pitch, and I'm going to be here all day. And um, so what was my point? So that's the first thing that zero knowledge proofs got used for. I'm really proud of that effect on. I'm seeing some hands come up. I'm really proud of the fact that the the crypto the the fact that the crypto industry operated without permission, right? We just, Bitcoin started it and Zcash and many others followed suit and we just did our thing. And that proved so valuable, both in, in anticipation, like speculative um, um, hope, you know, like investment for future value and also in actual live usage that, um, that made zero knowledge proofs into like a, a, a industrial strength, uh, widely trusted thing. So Zcash and, and the crypto, like the, the, uh, the, the permissionless, like outside of the system crypto revolution is what caused that science to become real and practical. And, and now zero knowledge proofs are potentially useful for a lot of other things, which was your question. The second thing, which I don't know the answer to. I've only seen two things so far. The first is private payments, Zek Wallet, Zek Wallet. The second thing that I've seen it for is for scalability of blockchains, because there's this deep information theoretic connection between privacy and scalability. Privacy is that you don't want information to go to someone unnecessarily, right? And in compute and computation, scalability is that you don't want information to go to someone unnecessarily because that takes up your bandwidth. So there's something really deep in there. And those are the first two things that I'm aware of is privacy and scalability. I don't know what other zero knowledge proofs could be used for. It feels really what powerful. They? <laughs> what couldn't they be used for? Yeah. Well, I mean, I think, again, that is, I think, for a whole new circle of innovation to decide. But one thing that we actually talked about when we discussed during the, uh, the, the podcast around this, like, should we hammer in the point of just how crucial privacy is for individual actors, such as, for example, human rights activists that are currently transacting in Bitcoin that could potentially, you know, eventually be physically extortable? Like, should we be coming up with more of these examples? Or should we just gradually build the technology into uh, the um, ecosystem of tomorrow and just collaterally have privacy be a feature that pops out of them. And so, you know, I think we, we're doing both and it's already too late because we just talked about it. But I think uh, in some in some extent, they are just also probably naturally just going to be better at some yeah, applications. Yeah, I, I, like some, I, I like something which I learned from the OCAP community, including Marcus Miller, was that if you find yourself making a trade-off between 
usability and security, well, that means you're doing it wrong, right? <laughs> so going around and lecturing people, you should give up your usability in order to get better security because you don't understand how dangerous the world is. That's not very effective. It's much better if you can find a way to give them the thing. And this is what I love about mobile coin and Signal, right? Signal is the most trusted messaging app for me personally, and sometimes I really need highly secure messaging. <laughs> Uh, but it's also plenty usable. You can just tell someone, just install that. It just works, right? And so that is where I prefer to uh, ask everyone to install Zek Wallet and come <laughs> hit me up and I'll send you a thousandth of a Zcash and that'll be fun and fast instead of like lecturing you about why you should care more than you do. All right, great. We have a question over there, Christine. Um, so I think this was this has been really great, and I think that the uh, blockchain and Zcash uh, and, and zero knowledge proofs are starting to become uh, zeitgeist mm -hmm. in, in many ways. Um, so you might have actually just said one by using the word OCAP, which nobody knows. But I, I'm actually curious what your view of the technology that's necessary to move us from where we currently are that people don't know about, um, and it doesn't have to be OCAP. But what what things do you think that we're missing? in order to be able to get to the state that you'd like to see society get to that is not well understood by most people in this room and should reach the zeitgeist? Well, from my perspective, I have a very limited perspective because I've been just focused on Zcash since as long as I can remember, like so about seven years. Um, and there's this Cambrian explosion of other things also derived from Bitcoin and Ethereum and Zcash and zero knowledge proofs all around, which I have only minimal understanding of. From my perspective, we, have th the fundamental breakthroughs. Blockchain, zero knowledge proofs, public key encryption. That's basically it. Uh, that's all I think we need. And now we're in the iterating mode, okay? So it's not scalable enough. Um, it doesn't have widespread enough uh, awareness and acceptance in society, but that comes from usability um, and like, like market demand, like someone, uh, groups of people start needing it and, and they are also are aware of it, stuff like that. So from my perspective, I'm not really looking at new technologies or new advances, but that's just my very myopic role in life today. Okay, well that's again, I think for the new generation to decide. As I'm asking Christine and Jan to get ready, we have one final question. What do you do when the next 1906 earthquake and we lose power and connectivity for a week. In a city. Right. We'll all be huddling out here. <laughs> I, I guess I would fall Where back to IOUs with people that I trust and we would settle up after the power comes back. <laughs> Great, nice answer. Okay, next one up. Thank you, Zuko. Thank you. Zach next Wallet. Up, Zach Wallet. Christine and Jan.